Good morning, guys. It is Friday on spring break, and we're going to continue on with Fuzzy Mud. We have read up through chapter six so far, so we're going to jump right in to chapter seven. And it's starting with Tuesday, November 2nd at 4.10 p.m. Let's go ahead and begin. Be careful not to step in that, Tamaya warned as Chad Hillegas made his way around the strange mud. What do you think all that weird fuzzy stuff is? She asked. She might as well have been speaking a foreign language the way Chad looked at her. He spit on the ground, then looked her in the eye and demanded, Where's Marshall? His tone was nasty, but Chad was her only hope, so she had to be nice to him. He's climbing up on the ledge trying to find the way back home. We got lost. When I heard you coming, at first I thought you might have been that crazy hermit you were telling me about, but then I saw your blue sweater, so... She shrugged and smiled. Chad spit on the ground again and then walked past her, heading after Marshall. He stopped as Marshall appeared from around the side of the hill. Marshall hesitated just a second when he saw Chad, but then he continued on down as if nothing were the matter. Hey, Chad, he said. Tamaya sensed something was wrong. She could hear it in Marshall's voice. I waited for you, Chad said. I know, Marshall said. I was on my way there, but then Tamaya said she knew a shortcut through the woods. What was I supposed to do? I have to walk home with her. My mom won't let me walk home alone, Tamaya explained. Chad glanced at her, then turned back at Marshall. You tried to make me feel like a fool just standing there on the corner waiting for you? No. Chad stepped toward him, then pushed him backwards. You think I'm a fool, don't you? Marshall regained his balance. No. With sudden ferocity, Chad lunged at him. He slugged Marshall in the face and then in the side of the neck. Tamaya screamed. Marshall tried to protect himself, but Chad hit him twice more, then grabbed him by the head and threw him to the ground. Leave him alone, Tamaya shouted. Chad glared at her. You're next, Tamaya, he said. Marshall tried to get up, but Chad's knee caught the side of his head, knocking him back down. Tamaya didn't think. She just reacted. She reached into the fuzzy mud and grabbed a handful of thick and gooey muck. She ran at Chad as he turned toward her and she shoved it into his face. He lunged at her, but she was too quick, stepping to the side. Chad stumbled past her, then bent over and covered his face with his hands. For a moment, Tamaya was too scared to move. Marshall scrambled fast to his feet. He grabbed both backpacks and shouted, Run! Tamaya ran as hard as she could for as long as she could until it felt like her lungs would explode. She didn't know if Marshall had seen the way home or if they were running deeper into the woods. She didn't care, just as long as she got away from Chad. She was still running when her foot caught in a tangle of vines, and the next thing she knew, she was sprawled across the dirt. Her heart pounded and her hands stung from the fall. She took several long, deep breaths and tried to make herself get back up, but she just didn't have any strength left. She was afraid to look behind her. Marshall had stopped running after he'd heard her go down. She saw him heading back towards her. He's still holding both backpacks. She could tell from the way that he walked that Chad must not have been too close. She turned. Chad was nowhere to be seen. She pushed herself back up into the sitting position as Marshall approached. You okay? I think so. Her knees were scraped and bloody. Her left wrist hurt from when she'd fallen, but she didn't think there was anything seriously wrong. Besides, Marshall was a lot worse. Dry blood and snot was caked between his nose, beneath his nose. Sweat dripped off his face. You think he's still coming? She asked him. I don't know. But if not today, tomorrow. Tamaya knew that was true. Chad's words still echoed in her head. You're next, Tamaya. And that was before she had smashed mud in his face. She got back up to her feet and took her backpack from Marshall. They continued walking the way they had been going. Is this the way, she asked. Were you able to see anything from the ledge? Not really, said Marshall. So what do you, what did you do anyways? What did you do that made him so mad? I answered a question in class. Tamaya didn't get it. So? It's different in seventh grade. You're not supposed to act like you know anything. The sky was beginning to turn dark. Tamaya worried that it wouldn't be long before they wouldn't be able to see anything. Look, smoke, Marshall declared. Where? It's smoke from a chimney, he told her. She tried to follow where he was pointing, and then she saw it. 
gray smoke against a gray sky. They hurried toward it, although for all Tamaya knew, it could have been coming from the home of a crazy hermit. She imagined them as Hansel and Gretel going to the evil witch. As they got closer to the source of the smoke, however, she saw that there wasn't just one isolated home, but a whole street of houses with parked cars and front lawns. Tamaya stepped over a short metal barrier on the road. She felt like she was going down on her hands and knees and kissing the asphalt, but Marshall might have thought that was a little too weird. She glanced back at the roadside that read, Dead End. The streetlights came on as they were walking from the woods. Tamaya suggested that they knock on someone's door to see if they could get a ride home, but Marshall said they didn't need to. He knew the way. It wasn't too far. Tamaya's right hand began to tingle, and she rubbed it with the other. It didn't exactly hurt. Her skin just felt sort of fizzy, like a freshly opened can of soda. Two times one equals two. Two times two equals four. Chapter eight. One little ergonym. The following is more of Jonathan Fitzman's testimony from the secret Senate hearings. Senator March. Excuse me, Mr. Fitzman, but I'm having a hard time trying to wrap my head around this. You said there are more than a trillion of your organisms in every gallon of BioLean? Jonathan Fitzman. A lot more. Senator March. These are man-made organisms, right? So how could you possibly make that many? Jonathan Fitzman. <laughs> You're right. That'd be impossible. I had to make only one. Senator March. I don't understand. Jonathan Fitzman. One organism capable of reproduction. That was the hardest part. That's what took me so long. The first few ergies I was a were unable to survive in the cell division process. The poor little fellows kept exploding. Senator March, what do you mean exploding? Jonathan Fitzman, kaboom! In the lab, we watched the images from the electron microscope projected onto a giant computer screen. It's quite cool. Every time one of my little ergies got to the cell division stage, kaboom! It looked like the 4th of July. Senator Wright, but eventually, I take it, you were able to create an ergonym that didn't explode? Jonathan Fitzman, the perfect ergonym. It took two and a half years and $500 million, but we did it. One little ergie. And 36 minutes later, we had two. The second one was an exact copy of the first. And 36 minutes after that, four, then eight, then 16. Every 36 minutes, the population just keeps on doubling. Senator March. Even so, to get the trillions of ergies you would need for just one gallon of BioLean, it would take years. Jonathan Fitzman. Not at all. Do the math. It took 12 hours and we had more than a million of the little guys. And by the next afternoon, more than a trillion. One little, two little, three little organisms, four little, five little, six little organisms. Chapter 9, Tuesday, November 2nd, 5.48 p.m. Weeds and clumps of grass poked through the cracks in the sidewalk. Tamaya crossed the street, sighed, then started up the wooden steps of her front porch. The middle step wobbled beneath her foot. Marshall's stupid shortcut had made her more than two hours late. Of course, she realized there never really was a shortcut, but that was the stupidest part about it. If he was afraid of Chad, he would have been safer walking along normal streets with lots of other people and cars around. Her house was dark. Her mother occasionally worked late, and Tamaya hoped with all her heart that this was one of those days. She wore her house key on a chain around her neck, but when she reached for it, all she could feel was an empty chain. Filled with panic, she almost broke the chain as she tugged it. Rotating it around her neck, she found the key. She breathed a huge sigh of relief. Somehow, it had twisted back behind her. Still, she knew her troubles were far from over. She unlocked the door. Hello, she called as she had opened it. I'm home. There was no answer. So far, so good. No questions, no lies. Tamaya switched on the lights as she moved quickly through her house toward the bedroom. The rooms were smallish and each one painted in bright colors. A red and a blue kitchen, a yellow living room, a green hallway. Tamaya's room was turquoise with a yellow closet door and a yellow window frame. She dropped her backpack and collapsed on the bed, but only for a minute. Her right hand still felt all tingly. She went to the bathroom and examined it under the light. Tiny red bumps were sprinkled all over her palms and fingers. 
She washed with an antibacterial soap and hot water, as, as hot as she could stand it. Using a washcloth, she cleaned the dirt and blood from off her legs and arms. She was putting a band-aid on her knee when the phone rang. She wondered if her mother had been trying to call her for a long time. She rushed into her mother's bedroom and answered just before the fourth ring. Hello? Hi, sweetie. Sorry, I'm running so late. Oh, that's okay, she said. Guilt pumped through her veins. How does pizza sound to you? Good. You all right? I'm fine, Tamaya said, trying her best to sound normal. Mushrooms, peppers, and onions okay? No onions. I'll tell them to put onions just on my half. Tamaya didn't argue, even though she knew her half would still taste oniony. I'll be home as soon as I can. Love you. Love you too, Tamaya said, and she waited until she heard the click on the other end and then hung up. She finished with the band-aid, then returned to her bedroom, where she changed out of her dirty clothes and into flannel pajamas. There was no reason that should make her mother suspicious, she thought. Now the nights were colder, and she and her mother both liked getting into their soft and cozy PJs, although usually after dinner. They drink hot apple cider and either watch TV together or, more often lately, work side by side. She gathered up her dirty clothes and took them to the laundry nook. There was nothing suspicious about her doing her own laundry either. She'd been doing it ever since she needed her favorite purple top for Monica's birthday last year. Once, when Marshall and his mother had been at her house, Tamaya's mother said, I suppose if Tamaya waited around for me to wash her clothes, she'd have to go to school naked. Tamaya had been so embarrassed and mortified by what her mother had said in front of Marshall that she'd run up to her room and hadn't come out until after Marshall and his mother had left. Even now, she blushed thinking about it. She dumped her dirty clothes into the washing machine, added soap, set the temperature, and then started it up. Listening to the swish of the water, she imagined she felt something like the way a murderer felt after he successfully destroyed all the evidence. Her right hand was still tingling like crazy. She went into her mother's bedroom and searched the drawers and cabinets, not sure what she was searching for. She came across a blue jar of something called restorative hand cream. The label said it was for dry, cracked, and irritated skin. Tamaya removed the lid and dipped her fingers into the white, chalky ointment. She smeared it all over the bumpy spots. It felt cool and soothing. It seemed to work almost immediately. The bumps didn't look as red, and the tingling wasn't as bad. From the other side of the wall, she could hear a rattle and a buzz of the garage door opening. Her mother was home. Two times four equals eight. Two times eight equals 16. Her mother set down the pizza, kissed Tamaya on the cheek, and said, Help yourself. I just need to answer this one email. The pizza box smelled of onions. Tamaya had to pick off a few strays before her putting her slice on a plate. She had to do it all left-handed so as to not to get any of the restorative hand cream on her food. One email turned into six, but that was fine with Tamaya. The more her mother was wrapped up in the work, the fewer questions Tamaya would have to answer. Her and her mother made a salad and she read through her emails. She rarely did only one thing at a time. So, did Miss Philbert like your report, she asked, as she set the salad on the table. We ran out of time, Tamaya told her. She didn't get to mine. Well, that's too bad, her mother said. You worked so hard on it. Her mother's hair and eyes were dark like Tamaya's, but she had lighter skin. She liked colorful clothes. Her green eyeshadow matched her blouse. Tamaya shrugged. I'll do it tomorrow. No one really cares about Calvin Coolidge anyways. Tamaya would have preferred to give a report on a different president, but by the time Miss Philbert had gotten around to calling on her, all the good presidents had already been taken. That was typical. Tamaya had sat quietly with her hand raised, but then someone else had shouted out, I'll take Lincoln! And then someone else claimed Washington. Miss Philbert had assigned those presidents to the shouters, even though she just told the class to sit quietly and wait until I call on you. It was Miss Philbert who suggested Calvage Coolidge to Tamaya when it finally became her turn. He was a lot like you, Tamaya, she had said. They call him the silent cow because he was known for being quiet. Miss Philbert said, being quiet as though it were some type of abnormal behavior. You're the one who just told everyone to sit quietly, Tamaya had thought. After dinner, Tamaya and her mother were working side by side in the living room sofa. The TV was on, but they were hardly watching. Her mother had a computer on her lap and Tamaya's notebook paper on the coffee table next to her and her history book. She wasn't supposed to just look things up on the internet. 
Tablets and smartphones were prohibited at Woodridge Academy. The headmistress, Miss Thaxton, wanted to, the students to do it the old-fashioned way. Even calculators were off-limits. Tamaya's mother looked from her laptop and asked if Tamaya had washed her hands after dinner. You have pizza sauce on you. Tamaya looked at her hands. It wasn't pizza sauce. Despite her mother's hand cream, the red bumps had returned. They got bigger, and there seemed to be more of them. The tingling sensation had also returned, although she hadn't noticed it much until now. She couldn't keep it from her mother any longer. It's not pizza, she said. I think I might have some kind of rash. And she held out her hand. Tamaya and her mother each had the same habit of biting their lower lip when thinking hard. Her mother was biting it now as she exclaimed to, to examine Tamaya's rash. It feels all funny too, Tamaya told her. Do you know how you got it? I noticed it after school, was all she could say. She had promised Marshall not to tell her mother or anyone about the woods. I put some of your stuff on it. What stuff? Restorative hand cream in a blue jar? Good, her mother said. I use it all the time. It absolutely works miracles. Tamaya was glad to hear that. I've got a meeting tomorrow morning, her mother told her, but if you want, I can cancel and take you to Dr. Sanchez. No, it's not that bad, Tamaya said. I'll put some more of the hand cream on it before I go to bed. We'll see how it looks in the morning, her mother told her. Later, Tamaya thought that maybe she should have agreed to let her mother take her to Dr. Sanchez. At least she wouldn't have to worry about Chad ambushing her on the way to school. You're next, Tamaya. Still, would a seventh grade boy really beat up a fifth grade girl at school with teachers all around? She doubted it. He might just push her down or something, but then she could blame her torn sweater on him. Then Chad's parents would have to buy her a new one. It was, in a way, it was sort of true. If it weren't for Chad, her sweater wouldn't have had a hole in it. Once again, she examined the hole in her sweater. She had tried looping some threads back through the hole and decided that maybe it wasn't at all that noticeable. Tamaya had another reason for not wanting to go to the doctor in the morning. It was something she'd never admit to her friends. She had never missed a day of school. At each end of the school year, she was presented with a certificate for perfect attendance. Those certificates didn't mean quite as much to her now as she had been when she was in second and third grade, but still, she hated to spoil her perfect record. Before going to bed, she said her prayers, and on this night, she included Chad Hillegas. She didn't pray for anything bad to happen to him. She asked God to help Chad find the goodness that lived inside his heart. 2 times 16 equals 32. 2 times 32 equals 64. And that, my friends, is where we're going to wrap up for our reading today. We just read chapters 7, 8, and 9. Check in with me later on this afternoon, and we are going to jump in in chapter 10. I hope you have a lovely morning, even though it's a little gusty out there. I hope that you have a beautiful day and have fun with your family. Check in with you later. Bye, my friends.